Well, hi, my name is Akal. In order to buy or sell, you have to have the money of the beast on your mind or in your hand. It's one of those words they don't translate correctly. And I just got back from a vacation, went to Oregon, California, the naked beach in San Diego. I spent a week there and uh, saw my sister and uh, went to that Burning Man festival. So I put some pictures up on my website, but nothing yet of Oregon or California, just the Burning Man. And uh, I really liked Oregon. It, it uh, seems like a really good place to live. And somebody on this Stormfront website, it's a white nationalist um, forum that always has interesting news on there. I always check their news forum for news and stuff and some they were saying how they were just somebody put a thing about Portland in there Portland Oregon I don't remember what they said but I was there back in the 70s and it was really I felt like it was a real community you know they had rivers running through the middle of town with beavers swimming in there and uh, let's see I spent uh, like around Thanksgiving through like maybe February or March no it was like March and uh, so it was, uh, I, back in the 70s, it was real nice. I stayed like, uh, I was living in a car because we just finished picking apples in Chelan around this time of year is when they start harvesting them. And they paid us like, uh, what was it, $6 a bin for the red delicious apples. If you picked a whole bin, which is like four feet by four feet by four feet high, you get uh, $6 for that. I could pick four bins a day, so 6, 12, 18, 24, I was making like $24 a day for picking apples. And it's even worse here in Arizona if you're picking lemons. I picked lemons in Yuma and around the late 70s, and the bin's the same size, but with the lemons you have to get, you have to wear gloves, and um, they give you some clippers, and you got to climb up these ladders and get these lemons and clip them off and put them in your thing and go back down the ladder and empty them in this big bin. And and um, they had a bunch of bums that they lived downtown there in uh, Yuma. And I guess they would spend their night at the mission. And so this bus would come by, a school bus would come by way before the sun comes up. And it would pick up all these bums and uh, take them out to pick lemons. And I got on there with them and... Uh, and I think there was a guy singing, a young man was singing on there, and he was pretty good. And uh, the bums wanted to hook up with me, and they said, yeah, come on, you know, we be we, you better hook up with a partner because you won't be able to fill this bin up. And I figured these guys wanted to pick me because, you know, I was young and I could pick more or something, but I, did, I wanted to do it myself, you know, so I was out there in the lemon fields in uh, Yuma there and I couldn't fill, fill the whole bin up in one day. I think there was some young guys that could but I couldn't so I spent the night out there and there was all kinds of fruit flies around and uh, I remember climbing up on the, they have these, they're not windmills, well they, maybe they are, I can't remember, but they had some kind of gas heater in there that would keep the frost away from the lemons if it got too cold and it did get pretty cold at night there, and uh, it's just like sand, you know. So I finally got my bin picked, and I think all I got for that was $18. So I was making like $9 a day back in the late 70s. But then somebody told me that you can get food stamps, and uh, they told me how to do it. And uh, so I went into the Yuma food stamp office down there and told them I was camping out on the Colorado River, and so I so they said, okay, but we've got to see where you're camping at. So I told them where I was camping, and I met them there the next day or so and uh, showed them where I slept out in the, along the Colorado River. And so I came back in. I don't know, the whole process took me like three days or so to get these food stamps. But eventually I got them. I can't remember how much they were. And they, they would basically last you, well, maybe they lasted me more, I think, Maybe they would last me three months because all I would eat when I was, I had, all I had was a backpack. And so I would buy like a three pound jar of peanut butter and a five pound bag of oats and a two pound bag of brown sugar 
and uh, I'd also get whatever kind of fruit they had, you know, on sale. Like if it was peaches or apples or bananas, I'd buy that to mix in with this cereal, and I'd eat the cereal cold. I wouldn't heat it up. I'd just put the oats in there, and well, I'd put the sugar in first, I think. Yeah, I did, and then, and then I think I added water and make sure that the sugar was... No, that's not how I did it. I put put it all in there. That's what I did. And sometimes I put nutmeg in it, and the nutmeg, it was fresh nutmeg that they used to sell in these cellophane bags, and I didn't, you know, after I ate this, you know, I would always feel like I was high on weed or something, because, you know, back then I didn't smoke, I, I smoked weed in high school, but I didn't smoke weed when I was on the road, you know, it's too, I, I wasn't, I, I gave it up, you know, I didn't drink or smoke or anything, you know, I stayed healthy to carry that 50-pound backpack everywhere. Uh, so let's see what we did. Uh, we hopped freights and we took a freight from Yuma to uh, Colton, California. And that's a big railroad yard there just east of Los Angeles. And I got out there and somehow hitchhiked to downtown LA. And uh, there was this guy in the park. He was maybe a year younger than me, maybe, or the same age. And uh, the grass was all green in this park. It was downtown L.A. And he just all of a sudden just peed right there in the park. You know, he just pulled it right out and just peed right there in the park. And I, I was like, <laughs> you know, wow, you know, I mean, that's pretty crazy. And uh, so I, I didn't really understand, but I think he was on some kind of psychiatric drug or something. But he was an interesting guy, I don't know why, and he told me that he was getting like a government check from the government. It was like 400 a month, I think, or maybe less. But I thought to myself, wow, if I could get a check every month for $400, that would be great, you know, because so, I was like picking lemons and apples and, you know, I worked to get the money I needed to buy shoes and clothes or whatever I needed. But, uh, yeah, the food stamps helped a lot, but, and, uh, and then, you know, when I was young, uh, we, I went up to, like, Idaho. It was Franklin, Idaho, I believe, and it was just on the other side of the border of Utah. And I uh, worked in this canning factory for a while. That was a good job. Made a lot of money, saved up a lot of money. That was seasonal, though. It only lasted a couple of months. There was a bunch of Iranian students there. But anyway, I haven't really told you that the mark of the beast, in order to buy a sow, you have to have the money of the beast on your mind or in your hand. It's one of those words they don't translate correctly. Let's zoom out a little bit here. And uh, there it is, the karagma. And it, it doesn't mean mark, you know. And, and if you look at the context, you can see that uh, you're, not, you're buying and selling, you know. A lot of people misunderstand. Here's the Greek-English lexicon. There's the word karagma, and it shows you that it means the impress on the coin, or stamped money coin. And they're starting to wise up on Wikipedia. They, they finally done did a pretty good edit job of uh, the article. on. It's called The Number of the Beast, but if you type in the mark of the beast, I, no, I think you got to type in the number of the beast. And I haven't been keeping track of that mark of the beast uh, I should at the Wikipedia. I finally got my editing rights back uh, on Wikipedia. They kicked me off for talking about the Holocaust and 9/11. You know, they don't allow, they don't like people to put original research in there. You know, it's got to be a what they say um, a reliable source. So, like if you cite some quack journal or something and I mean I don't think that they consider the the journals that these 9-11 people publish and I don't think they consider those journals legitimate and I haven't really looked at those articles in a long time because that's what I got kicked off for I looked at I look at the uh, Kennedy assassination page and they have a page for the three tramps on there and somebody just recently shortened it these Three tramps were arrested on the grassy knoll right after Kennedy was uh, killed. They were in a box car, and I have all this up on my website. But their article on Wikipedia—they don't show the pictures. You know, they—they 
this, these guys, E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis, were Watergate burglars, and um, th and they caught him in like '73 or so, and some Kennedy assassination buff knew about knew about the three tramps because everybody was trying to figure out who these guys were because there was no there were no arrest records for these people, but there were a few police reports, and I don't know when these police reports came out, but one of the cops that arrested these guys, he said that he. They, these these men were cursing at him after they were found, and that he had to jack a shell into his shotgun to get these guys off the train. You know they weren't going to come. So um, there's these other Kennedy assassination researchers think that the tramps are these real hobos. You know just stupid country bumpkin hobos. And uh, from what I've heard about these guys, I think the name is Abrams. Uh, I can't Doyle and somebody else. Um, they uh, don't. Uh, they weren't that kind of people. People said, "Oh, these were the most friendly people. They would never swear and things like that." And of course, they would have obeyed a policeman before, you know, they had a, a shell put in there. And not only that, but I, the, these guys. They said that they just left the Salvation Army in Texas, down there in Dallas, and they were going to hop a freight to go somewhere else. And, uh, but like they had clean clothes on because they just left the, the Sally down there. And I was telling you about these bums that slept in the Sally in Yuma. They usually have clothes available there and they take showers. So, and I think they make you take showers before you get in their beds there and give you clean clothes. So if you were at the Sally, you would have, and these three tramps allegedly, um, smelled like wine and, well, I, I mean, it's kind of confusing because there's actually six tramps that were there and they're confusing these other guys and they don't even look anything like them. So anyway, we've got that big conspiracy that they don't like you to talk about on Wikipedia. And same with this 9-11 thing. Very few people realize that this Building 7 came down on the, the, that evening, you know, after World Trade Center building one and two came down this building seven came down just like a controlled demolition it just came straight down the top picture is when the explosion happened and then the whole thing starts coming straight down like in free fall speed and like the government never really had an investigation of this you know a congressional investigation where congressmen can ask these people questions it was like a it was almost, it was like the Warren Commission report, this 9-11 Commission report. And in the 9-11 Commission report, they said that um, fires caused this building to go down. But uh, st st no steel frame building has ever come straight down like that because of a fire. Not only that, the fires were very s small. They only were on like one floor. And uh, here's a picture showing what happened in Madrid. This building was totally engulfed in flames, and it was a steel frame building. Yet, yeah, the, you know, the next day or so, it was still standing. So nothing hit Building Seven, you know. And uh, they said that the the official report said that the building came down because of uh, a, f a small fire, nothing like this. But uh, there's a lot of architects and engineers that that realize that this is. Uh, fraud that the whole reason for 9-11 was to get us involved in these wars to steal the oil because we really are running out of oil and there's really no substitutes. This fracking they're doing is polluting the water and and using up the water. Take They have to shoot these poisonous chemicals down into the ground to uh, release this gas and stuff. So a lot of people have, they turn their faucets on and they can light a match and they'll because of this fracking fluid and stuff like that. And and uh, who knows how much longer these people are going to be able to live there. Maybe their children will be deformed or they're going to get cancers quickly. So they, you know, George Bush will go down in history as trying to keep civilization going with the oil because there's really no substitute for it. There's a pretty good show on now. It's called, like, Revolution. And supposedly the 
uh, it's, well, the plot is coming out that somebody, or rather, caused all the electricity to, to just disappear, go out. It's probably the military, you know, I think that's what they would do. I th really honestly think that, you know, these plutocrats, they all have places to go and they have airplanes to go in and yachts like almost all the oil sheiks in the Middle East have big yachts and a lot of these Russian tycoons have yachts so that they can take their families and everybody they love and, and pay them off and everything, can go to Australia or New Zealand or Paraguay or someplace where the people that live there are self-sufficient. You know, like in Paraguay they use uh, those little, um, you know, horses and oxen and stuff to plow everything. But anyway, getting back to that, revolution is like I said, that somehow or other all the electricity goes out, you can't, you know, use your computer or phone and everything, but people have adjusted and they have little farms and cows and things like that but uh, the police are uh, they have like a military and you have to pay them tribute you know part of your crops and all that but uh, uh, you know I mean it's like I think that you know a lot of these shows are kind of preparing us so that when it happens we'll we won't panic and we'll say well wow you know they you know we, we saw what these people did and we're gonna have to do that you know uh, like they had that show um, on Channel 9, ABC TV had a, it was like a three-hour documentary or doc, you know, it was like futuristic and they're showing how if the water rises and uh, it's going to flood New York and uh, it was kind of, you know, was, and then for some reason or other they were showing all these illegal aliens coming right up through Tucson. They, they had a map there. This, and they were showing all the illegal that's coming up through here. And, uh, yeah, I should put a link about that on Facebook. I think I did when it first came out, but I, it's uh, kind of the future I think, you know, we're going to have because uh, things can't go on like this. You know, like in the news they say that the Arctic uh, Sea is practically all melted. And... Uh, Greenland is melting. They, they've never had records of, well, it happened many hundred thousand years ago or so where Greenland melted and, and things like that. And, uh, but it's happening again, and if it rises, you know, it's going to like flood Bangladesh, and it's, they already have bad floods there, and it'll flood uh, all these other places too. Like New Orleans, you know, it's below uh, sea level, and you saw what happened during Katrina, you know, when there's a catastrophe, the police are all going to uh, go home and take care of their families. They're not going to be out there protecting you, you know. So there's what happened there in uh, Katrina. I don't know how many murders there were or anything like that, but, you know, everybody, a lot of people lost everything, and half the city is vacant right now. Well, I didn't really know what I was going to talk about. I spent a lot of time on that, and that's probably a good thing, because, oh gosh, after getting back from this vacation, it's like I've got to deal with these $500,000 worth of liens. That includes the interest owed. I think it started out at like 400000 on 10 lots I own out there. So I was trying to trace down who the uh, lien holders were, and I found out it's the one of the CEOs of... Uh, title insurance agency here and he also owns another company his name is uh, Thomas W. Sullivan Sr. and um, he was friends with these developers that were going to develop these lots and I thought I was going to be a millionaire but the economy went bad There's, I could write a book about it this is just a, two of my files I took like the best stuff out of there and put it in here but there's a uh, I got back and I was doing some research on this, and uh, I don't know. I'll show you the page here with my notes and everything. It doesn't, it, but anyway, this Western Recovery and these prior developers—they've got a big lawsuit going on right here in Tucson right now, and uh, apparently they ripped this guy off named Sparlin, and Sparlin invested in this new Tucson subdivision too. It's uh, 
He, it's real, and all these guys, Mr. Figueroa, and every, and all these guys that I used to work with to try to develop these lots, are ending up like being accused of securities fraud and and all kinds of fraud. This the the guy has a really good lawyer from Scottsdale. His name is uh, let's see, I got it up here. Uh, Kenneth E. Chase at KennethChaseLaw.com. He specializes in fraud, and so it doesn't look good for Mr. Figueroa and all these other people that were working on this uh, this um, subdivision. I was here's some papers I had from there. I was gonna build on there. I've got all my building plans, got my permits, and these guys, Figueroa and all them, were lying to us. You know, they were lying to everybody and said that we had to, we couldn't build on our lots with it, we, because there wasn't any sewers there. But, but I, here I got this permit. Well, he approved. He approves it. He recommends approving this. But it was this was back in uh, uh, November thirteenth, two thousand. And so I was on my way over to the other part. You know, I was drawing my plans up. To I was going to start a commune out there, but first I was going to build. There's my septic tank and my little cabin. And I was going to. There's the building plans with. I was going to have windows all around, and, and uh, so I had to get all these plans in before I went in there. But they uh, gave me. Uh, I don't remember. I think I, yeah, I had to get my sewer plans approved. See, none of these plans were approved. It was like a half acre lot there. And then I even went to the electric company to find out how much it would cost to bring electricity over there. And I was going to buy a backhoe and start, uh, I was going to, because I owned a bunch of lots there. You see, it would have been profitable for me to dig the trench myself with a backhoe. I mean, I could have I had the money and everything, and I was starting to get to work on it. And uh, then these guys came along and said, "Oh, look, we're going to develop these lots, you know, and you'll be able to sell them." 